Morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Roland Schuster. I am the managing director of the Schuster Group and NFP, um, as well as the founder and president of Tango. Um, today's session, we're going to talk about emerging retirement plan trends, things you really do need to know. There's a lot going on in this space. Um, and those of you that are fiduciaries of your plan, we felt it important to continue to provide this kind of education so that you're up to speed with uh, you know, what you need to do to basically stay out of trouble and improve the outcomes of your plan. Um, with me today is Mary, or actually it's Amber. Amber, I'm sorry, is Mary speaking today or, is, or are you, Amber? Yes, I am, Roland. This is Mary. Amber's Hi, Mary. Great. Hi. <laughs> um, Mary is an expert in this with FML, uh, one of our Tango partners. Um, they provide accounting and business advisory services to lots of nonprofits throughout our network. Wonderful, wonderful partner. Um, and then we have Matt Coles, uh, part of the Schuster Group, our senior advisor, helping lots of our clients manage their retirement plan. So we have a couple of really great folks to guide us through this content. We do have Amber Tucker, who is also part of the FML group um, and just a great contributor to our Tango Tango Education Series. So guys, thanks for being with us. If we could just flip the uh, tab. I, I want to spend a, a, just a quick moment. Many of you know us, the Schuster Group. We founded Tango. We recently have been acquired by a group called NFP, which is the fifth largest employee benefit broker in the country, second largest employee benefit or second largest retirement plan provider in the country and top 10 in property casualties. So it has given us much more resources to help us expand our footprint and support and focus in the nonprofit sector. Um, as I mentioned, FML is a wonderful advisory firm focused on uh, accounting, tax, and um, just general nonprofit advisory services. Um, so we've got a really good team here backing this up. And, and Tango continues to grow. The reason we do this and the reason actually I created Tango was to support the nonprofit sector in, in a unique, impactful way with our businesses. And first and foremost, we're providing lots of education. Secondly, we have lots of preferred services that we encourage you to tap into. Um, and lastly, we have our mission support, which are things along the lines of our scholarships to, to rising stars in the nonprofit space. Um, our DEI initiative is really taking off. So we're doing a lot of good, I think, to support your mission. And please stay close to Tango and let us know if we can help you in, in, in any way. I do want to give a shout out to our partner network. You'll see them here listed. Our traditional partners are on the left. And they range in professional services from lobbying to legal, insurance, investments, um, accounting, marketing, communications. We have a new uh, Tango partner, Franklin Pierce University, who's joined us. And they're providing uh, uh, online resources and, and, and course courses at a pretty significant discount. Um, and we're doing some coursework with them. We've actually created a curriculum with the university and are gonna be educating students on some of the fundamental Tango nonprofit method uh, components. So really excited about that initiative. To the right, you're gonna see the insurance partners um, that have come to us and are providing resources um, unique to Tango, uh, special plans, preferred discounts, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're in the market for professional services, please think of Tango. Um, we are happy to answer any questions and connect you to the right people. So um, without any further ado, I am going to flip it over to Mary and Matt and let them carry the baton and educate you guys on what you need to know with respect to our emerging retirement plan landscape. So thanks everyone. Great to be with you. Enjoy the session. Thanks, Rowan. Hi, I'm Mary Wazenski. Good morning, everyone. And I work on a bunch of benefit plans at FML. I'll just talk a little bit about myself. Um, and thanks to Amber Tucker, who is our nonprofit, one of our specialists who's very involved with Tango for inviting me to uh, speak today. So really appreciate that, Amber. Um, I'm a director in the audit practice along with Amber. 
And I do have some nonprofit experience, even though she is the specialist, but I really do specialize in benefit plans, which is why I can speak to this today. It's one of my things I, I run a lot over the summer, several audits, big and small, um, different types of plans, pension plans, 401k. So a lot of experience, even 11k. So big and small plans. Um, I'm happy to be here. I've been with the firm for it'll be 17 years uh, in May. So I've been with the firm uh, with FML for a long time and love it. And I worked my way up to director. So thanks very much. I'll just let Matt introduce himself and then I'll get going in the first part. Thanks, Mary. And thanks, Rollin. Uh, Matt Coles, uh, Senior Advisor with the Schuster Group NFP. As Rollin mentioned, uh, what I do all day long is help my retirement plan clients manage their fiduciary responsibilities as it relates to their retirement plan, making sure they're doing all the things to not only keep themselves out of trouble, but also hopefully deliver a high impact retirement plan that's going to set up their uh, participants for a successful retirement. So that's what I do, what I focus on. I also do spend some of my time engaging with the participants and have done that for many years. Uh, so I have a good perspective on those educational needs and what your plan participants are looking for and, and what help they need in, in those education uh, meetings. So can definitely shed some light on that and some perspective uh, from those years of doing those type of educational uh, meetings. And uh, also, as Amber uh, stated, I've been doing this for a long time, actually 21 years this year, and I've been with Rollin uh, for the last nine of those 21 years. So I've been with the Schuster Group for quite some time, and again, looking forward to providing this education session today. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so I will kick it off here, the first section, and then Matt will kind of round it up at the end. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat box. And then, um, you know, Rob, I think, or Rollin will just kind of pose the question when we're at a pause. We're happy to have an interactive session. So if you could, if you would like to, no problem at all. It's, it's great if we hear from you. So feel free to put those questions in the chat box. Perfect. So I'm going to talk about a little bit, a little bit of a review here of the SECURE Act and CARES Act and then some audit considerations. Um, as mentioned, I'm an audit professional. So when it comes down to what the requirements are for an audit, when you need an audit and what we do. I'll be talking about that this morning as well. But just a little bit of a recap because we're coming out of a pandemic world, hopefully, right? Here's the hope, fingers crossed here that um, we can get back to a new normal, what that will be. But the SECURE Act, um, so there were two acts. So the SECURE Act was actually passed last December of 2019. And that initially just tried, just relaxed some um, provisions in retirement planning. So it was actually um, one of the largest retire benefit plan and retirement reforms that we've had in uh, US history. And that was before the CARES Act. The CARES Act was actually signed due to the pandemic and think the economy kind of taking a decline. So that wasn't expected. It was gonna start with the SECURE Act. And as you can see, there were some, um, in the SECURE Act, there were some clauses that you could increase the cap on payroll contributions from 10% to 15%. It allowed part-time workers to participate in 401ks. So specifically with that, if you have part-time workers, if they've worked 500 hours in three consecutive 12-month periods, they were eligible to participate in the 401k plan or a 403b as well. Um, they also are excluded from non-discrimination testing and top-heavy testing. So if you're familiar with a benefit plan, depending on the plan, uh, generally some non-discrimination testing has to be done and those part-time, part excuse me, individuals would be excluded from that testing. And that's a routine thing that your provider usually uh, does for you. Um, you're also not required to match uh, part-time people. So there were some relaxation to allow part-time people to participate and then making it a little bit easier for employers to be able to allow them in. Hey, Mary, also, can, you, can you let them know when that started? So when they have to actually, if somebody has a 401k, when they should have started monitoring those hours? Um, so when the law went into effect in, on December 20th, if they already, if they had been working 500 hours in the three consecutive 12 month periods, they could participate right away. You could, you could have put them into the plan. Yes. And then going forward, if you have part-time people, once they hit 
three consecutive 12 month periods of 500 hours in those 12 month periods, they can participate in the plan going forward under the SECURE Act. Um, so yeah, we'll go to the next slide here. And the SECURE Act also, so there were changes to the required minimum distribution. So the SECURE Act actually, what this act did was it raised the age for a required minimum distribution from 70 and a half to 72. And that was after 1231 of 19. So the act went into, it was signed into law December 20th of 19. And after December 31st, if you are 70, 72 or above, that was the age it was, excuse me, we raised uh, the required minimum distribution too. So before it was 70 and a half, you had to take a distribution. Now, if you're seven, it's 72. If you're, so if you're 71, you didn't have to take the required minimum distribution. Um, it also modified filing penalties, you can see there. And it allowed employers of all sizes to join together to create uh, more of pooled plans. So pool plan provider, and that's something that's kind of up and coming. So all of these regulations in the SECURE Act were to uh, relax some regulations to allow uh, more people to participate in plans and for providers to be able to provide plans um, to more, more people with not so hard stipulations. So if we go to the CARES Act, but then what happens, so the SECURE Act was signed into um, law. What happens is that the pandemic comes along and in March, um, Congress signed in, signed in the CARES Act. And that was really, as I said, a reflection of quickly responding to a halting economy. And that's why this, so it, what it did was it actually took some of the relaxation from the SECURE Act and it even relaxed it further, knowing that the economy was not, was kind of going downhill, trying to save companies from problems with hiring and running their 401k plans. So specifically, it also allowed participants of 401ks to be able to get a coronavirus related distribution. So if you recall, they could get a, a distribution up to $100,000. Um, and it also delayed payment of that $100,000 back. So if you, you could borrow or you could get a CRD, if you borrowed the $100,000, Generally, a rule for a 401k or 403b would be $50,000 as the max that you can borrow. We'll increase it to 100. Um, it allowed loan suspension, like suspension of the payments. So participants who took a distribution under the CARES Act did not have to start paying for up to one year. But there were rules. So you could only take that loan or that distribution from March 27th to December 31st, 2020. So if you took the distribution in that time, you were allowed uh, to de defer paying, starting the payments back for up to one year. Uh, it also suspended, so the CARES Act took what the SECURE Act did and raised the minimum required distribution age, and then it had a whole bunch of stipulations to also help relax the required minimum distributions, and it actually suspended all of them for 2020. So not only was there an age uh, change with the SECURE Act, the CARES Act took that another step further and said, we're, you know, you're allowed to suspend any required minimum dis distribution. Now, if your plan did, you know, took advantage of any of these regulations under the CARES Act or the SECURE Act, you do have to formally amend the plan, but the amendment was not required until the end of 2022. So generally as an auditor, what I do is I always pull a plan document, right? So I understand your prototype of the plan, how it works. And then if you have amendments, I pull those and make sure that the plan is functioning to the plan document and to the amendments. So you do have to formally have an amendment to the plan if you've taken advantage of any of these things, but don't worry if you haven't done it yet, you have until the end of 2022 to formally document as such. So you'd wanna reach out to your plan providers or your legal counsel to be able to put forward a formal amendment. And we can keep going to the next slide. So that was a little bit of a review, high level review of um, some of the CARES Act and the SECURE Act stipulations. Now what kind of is up and coming and Matt's gonna actually further talk a little bit later about some changes and some up and coming things with the CARES and SECURE Act type things. But what I did find out was, this is interesting and I think this might be helpful. So for those businesses that had to lay off people during the pandemic, 
and then they rehired people. It pro they there was a law here, this Consolidated Appropriations Act that was signed into law this past December 27th of 2020. And so what it said was it prevented a partial plan termination from March 13th, 2020 for ending on March 31st, 2021. So about a year period. So what that means, that means that if you've laid people off and say you laid more than 20% of your workforce off, but then you hired them back within that year, your plan is not gonna be treated as having a partial plan termination. Because generally under, under what's one thing I also look for as an auditor, I will look to see if the number of participants has decreased at any time by 20% or more. If it decreases by 20%, there are rules and filings that have to be uh, addressed. And it also was reflected in financial statements and on the 5,500 that there was a partial plan termination. Um, it's generally more paperwork. It's just a, it's a, um, it's not, you know, terribly cumbersome. However, it is something that has to be addressed. So if, however, with this act, if you've dipped below 20%, you've laid off and then they came back. And so between the beginning and ending of those dates, the 20% is not, you know, from reflected, then you're not, um, you don't have to worry about a partial plan termination. So that's kind of one thing nice. So you might want to ask your uh, 401k or 403b providers uh, or pension plan provider, um, your trustee or custodian or somebody like Matt, um, if that you qualify for that kind of documentation needed. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So just, I wanted to put some basics on here for you guys. Uh, if you're developing a plan or your plan's growing, your nonprofit is growing, and you know what an audit entails, what I'm looking for, what are the key things and highlights. So generally, if you your plan has more than 100 participant, participants, excuse me, you would be required to have a benefit plan audit. So you'd have a 401k or 403b plan audit. Now, if the next year it dip below, dips below 100, usually you still need an audit for the next year. It's two years out if your participants decrease. But if, they're, if they hit 100 or you have 100 more in the plan, you, do, you will require an audit to be filed with your form 5500. So the 5500, uh, you might know, that's a tax form that's filed and that's filed with all plans. It's just that for, for plans that are with 100 participants or less, uh, you don't need an audit. So you kind of escape that requirement. But once you hit 100, you do need an audit. And so just so you know, so generally your uh, trustee or custodian would file that 5500 for you, whether you use Fidelity or somebody like Matt or a pension consultant, something like that. And that's due actually July 31st. So if your plan year ends December 31st, the 5,500 would be filed by July 31st. Now there is an extension. Uh, there's a form that's, fi that's filed uh, most often, quite frankly, a lot of uh, providers do file the form on your behalf. You might wanna check though, I do recommend my clients to check to make sure if you're expecting an extension that the, the extension form does get filed and that gives you till October 31st, okay? So when I do benefit plan audits, um, most of mine actually do get extended. Uh, and it's just because we're working on the audit. There's no penalty, there's nothing, it's an audit back extension. You have to just file the form and then you have until October 15th to file. So we'll go to the next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about fiduciary responsibility. So if you're a fiduciary of a plan, um, you're part of plan management, plan administration, you have a responsibility um, to hire an auditor if needed and to hire the right service providers and professionals to be able to administer your plan. Um, ERISA, so ERISA is the, is the um, guidance that oversees benefit plans. Um, they hold, it holds plans administra administrators, excuse me, responsible to ensure that an audit takes place, that the stipulation, the function and operations of the plan um, are advantageous to the participants and that um, the transactions are monitored and reported accurately. Um, so it's really important that whoever your service providers are, whether you need an audit, you need an advisor, an investment advisor, payroll provider, trustee or custodian, that you hire uh, skilled professionals with knowledge that can help you in you know, your industries and help you administer the plan. Very important. Um, we'll go to the next slide. 
So there are some risks. So just so you know, so when I do audits, the DOL can come in at any time and pull a 5,500 and pull uh, an audit of benefit plans, the financial statements and do an audit themselves. I have had um, at least one, if not two of my plans audited by the DOL, which was clean, which was good. I actually advised um, another firm who was being audited by the DOL and I was just a consultant helping them get through the audit because they had some issues. Uh, because I do so many benefit plan audits, I was able to advise them as to what to do to get through their DOL questions. It's kind of like a tax audit, really. What happens is you get a notice. Uh, you as the plan uh, administrator will get the notice as well. And you'll be advised that the DOL pulled your filing for an audit. So it's just like kind of like a tax return audit. And the DOL performs an audit of the 5500 and the financials. And they actually audit your audit firm's file. So my whole file when I was audited was pulled, the DOL re-audited, did what they wanted to do. And what they do is they send you a list of questions, just like the tax person, like you get this list of questions and you've got to answer the questions and just advise them as to where to look for things. And because they might not know, they don't know the plan, they don't know your nonprofit, your agency or organization. So they're going to want to know things. And then hopefully everything is there, which I got through it. And I, I was as as I said, I was able to advise um, a company that was having a lot of trouble and we got through it. So they do they do pull filings. Um, they can access penalties too. So if there's something that isn't being taken care of, isn't filed appropriately, you don't have an audit, you should have an audit, something is deficient with your filing or the plan, you're not operating to uh, the plan document, there are penalties and it can be a per day penalty of up to $2,000 right there, 2097. So it is something to really um, keep your pulse on and make sure your service providers, if you have any questions, de definitely reach out and ask uh, you know, your questions. Go to the next slide. So what do, what do auditors look for? So I put this here, you know, people, when they have a 401k plan, I've been through several first time audits, you know, what are we looking for? So we're looking to make sure that the people in the plan are eligible, okay? So it, like I had last year actually, it was just a, an easy miss, but somebody that was underage, usually it's 21 and older. You can have plans that are 18 and older to contribute to a 401k. It just depends on the, depends, excuse me, on the plan document. So I pull that plan document and if it says 21 and older and there's younger people in the plan, they were ineligible to be in the plan. Okay. Um, and even if there's, sometimes there's requirements for service, if they have to have worked a thousand hours, well, it, in the plan doc now you can actually have part-time people but if the plan doc wasn't amended let's just say um if they have to have worked for a year before they can be in the plan or 90 days or there's a window so i'm looking to make sure who's in the plan is eligible to be in the plan um this is a big one here contributions you want to make sure that they're remitted timely and consistently so that means generally if you remit a contribution by the 15th day of the following month that would be considered acceptable. So if you had a pay period ending January 20th and you got the contribution in by February 15th, generally that is acceptable. However, there are some grave things, of course, with these rules. If you consistently, let's say you consistently remit your contribution two days after payroll, every time, two days after payroll, that consistent clause, if you, even if you got it in three weeks after, but it was before the 15th of the month, the DOL could come and say you actually were delinquent and late because it was out of your consistency. So you wanna be consistent. Consistent is very important and they will look at when you make a contribution because if that's when the participants are expecting their contribution and you don't do it for a few weeks, that can be considered delinquent. So consistent is very important. I've had clients all over the place, you know, day after, two months after, you know, a week after, that's when it triggers um, a problem possibly that you're not being consistent with the contribution and the DOL could consider that to be delinquent and not timely is what I mean by that. Um, this is a good one too I've had. What is the third one down? What is the plan definition of compensation? Okay, so if you have overtime, if uh, you have a shift differential, or um, tips or something like that for the nonprofit or you know there's some kind of different hours 
um, drive time or expenses or something, you know, all of these different payroll codes, you have to understand what compensation people are getting is eligible for a 401k contribution. Sometimes, you know, the overtime might not be uh, part of compensation as according to the plan document. And if you're, if you're making contributions on participants behalf and it's for compensation that's not included to be um, calculated against for a 401k, that would be a delinquency. I've had it generally where I've had a mistake is um, like an overtime type thing where, you know, a certain amount of overtime or bonus is a good one. So is a bonus, that's another great one. If you give bonuses or you've given any kind of, um, you know, incentive compensation, uh, if is that really included for a 401k contribution calculation, or is that not included in the definition of compensation in the plan document? Those are two great ones, overtime or bonus, usually. Um, you want to make sure that you're calculating the contribution on whatever compensation is defined. Um, so in the same thing on the ER side, you want to make sure that if you're offering a match, that the match calculations are uh, and elections are accurate. So I, what I do as an auditor is I actually pull a pay period or five pay periods during the year, say. I actually take payroll, recalculate the 401k contribution based on the plan document and the match if applicable and make sure that it matches what got contributed into the person's account. So we actually are recalculating based on payroll data. Okay, so that's what an auditor would ask for when you, when you go through an audit. We usually sample participants and there's a sum, you know, a summary of participants, and then we we calculate uh, random contributions. Um, in service distributions, hardships and loans. Hardships are one thing that's very looked at by the DOL as well, because there's a lot of rules with hardships. Who qualifies for a hardship? Is it really a hardship versus a loan? Um, you have to fill out paperwork. And generally now, though, the good thing is that a lot of third-party administrators or custodians are the uh, participant actually goes online and goes right through them and they will uh, determine if a hardship is allowed. So if you work with a trustee or custodian, third party administrator that does that on your behalf, it kind of allevi alleviates a little bit of stress on that. But I've had clients just doing it themselves. So you want to make sure you're following the rules for hardships. I put asset certification just because from an audit perspective, a lot of my clients don't really know what I mean by that. And honestly, so if whatever um, trustee or custodian you're using, whether it be Fidelity or Prudential or something like that, they will certify your assets at the plan year end. And there's a certification that says these assets are complete and accurate. That goes in an audit file. That's something that the DOL will look at. That's something that the auditors look at. You want to make sure that your assets are certified. If you, for some reason, if there is not a certification that triggers a higher level audit than a limited scope audit, which we're generally talking about, that could be a full scope investment audit. And that takes a lot more time than just having a certification that says these, and it has to say complete and accurate, just so you know. So auditors come along and ask for that certification. That's what that is. You can go to the next slide. I'll kind of move along here. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about re retaining plan records. Um, it's so important. Okay, it's so many, and it's so hard now that sometimes things are electronic. It could be easy, it could be hard. But you want to make sure you're retaining plan records, um, copies of your Form 5500. It's for six years from the filing date. Um, I generally even say seven because that's usually a tax return date, but the rule for 5500 is actually six years. Um, Non-discrimination coverage, testing results, Fidelity bond. This is a great one that people forget. I've had clients that have come into to do an audit forget that they needed to have a bond. The plan needs to be bonded. The plan needs a bond of generally about at least five hundred thousand uh, dollars. But there, your policy, generally your umbrella policy or your general insurance will cover ERISA. You want to make sure it says fiduciary or ERISA coverage in your insurance. So if you have a, a benefit plan. There are rules and we can um, certainly uh, you know, advise us to rules, but you need to have a bond. And most of the time, as I said, when you use a fidelity or you use a trustee, they will ensure that the plan is bonded as well. But sometimes I've had it where I've had a, a client have to go back and actually go buy insurance, like get additional insurance for their 401k. So it is something that's required. And that's something that the DOL actually looks at to make sure that you have the right insurance for the plan. 
financial reports and supporting documentation. What that means is, so any reports from your trustee, your custodian for the year you wanna retain. We call those a trust statement. So you can pull a trust statement and that's the statement of assets and all the balances and the transactions. Um, one thing we always ask for, plan documents, right? Any amendments, I was just mentioning amendments, census data, census is the people in the plan, the rates of pay, hours worked, loans, if there's a loan, and minutes. So minutes is a big one. So I must say, a lot of plans that are just starting out or they just hit the 100 per, you know, people threshold for an audit, some of those, um, the companies just are not keeping minutes of an administrative committee. It's important, even if you talk to somebody like Matt um, and you talk to him about your plan and you get advice or an investment advisor, try to take minutes and try to, even if it's just a short minutes, but it, it just proves out that you're being fiduciary, fiduciary, uh, fiduciary, I'm not sure if that's the word, responsible for the plan. You're being a good fiduciary, okay? So you want to show that you're having meetings, that you're monitoring the plan. Monitoring is actually an internal control um, uh, aspect that's very important, the monitoring of the plan, the monitoring of the assets. But having minutes and showing that you're having conversations, and even if it's just you, an executive director, and your right-hand person, and you're talking about the plan, that's perfectly fine. Jot some minutes down if you have it. If you can, put it in the file. And if you were ever audited or DOL audit can show how you were working and ensuring the plan is operating appropriately is, is a good thing. I recommend some minutes. Even if it's just quarterly or twice a year, it's still good. We can keep going. So moving along here. IT responsibilities. Um, of course, everything's electronic, right? And all those things I just mentioned might be electronic. So just make sure... You have them in a secure place, really, is what it comes down to. Do you have a plan to address a cybersecurity breach? Do you have a disaster recovery plan? So depending, you know, hopefully organizations and your financial data, you're either backing up or you have a plan or it's kept at an, in, the, in an offsite location and they have a plan. Um, if that's the case, um, I have a couple of slides on SOC 1 reports, but um, you want to make sure the controls of where your data is being stored um, are adequate. Okay. So, you know, IT related responsibilities are very important, especially in this day and age. And what I suggest is, um, I think, so we'll go to the next slide and I'll talk about what a SOC and, and Before we do, Mary, I know we've seen where the Department of Labor is supposed to be issuing some guidance uh, to plan sponsors on this cybersecurity uh, steps that you should be taking to protect yourself against these uh, cybersecurity breaches. So we'll be on the lookout for that. And hopefully more information to come on those particular steps that you can take as uh, plant sponsors. Perfect. So this SOC report, what I want is a report that you should be reviewing and you always should be reviewing as a plan, uh, as a plan administration, a sponsor and a fiduciary. So what's a SOC report? Some of my clients, you know, they're new to plans. They don't know what that is. Uh, they're internal control reports. There's one called a SOC one report and there's a SOC 2 report. And it actually with SOC 1s, there's type 1, type A and B, but I won't get into that detail. So every uh, trustee and custodian shop, if they are responsible, they're a third party administrator of your data, they're responsible to have an internal control audit because your financial data of your plan is being held by someone else, right? They're, they're, they're running all the transactions, right? You're relying on them to book transactions, to book assets, to facilitate the participants. You're depositing money in their accounts, right? They are running the show. So it's really important that you're aware if there's any breaches in their databases, right? Because that's where your information is being stored. So the one thing about it is, so there's a SOC 1 report. The SOC 1 does not um, talk about cybersecurity. A SOC 1, though, is important in the sense that it talks about the internal control over financial reporting. So it's about controls to make sure the numbers that you're seeing on your statement are accurate and complete. Okay, so it's justification for its controls behind all those numbers and what's going
Mary, I think we lost your sound, your audio. Uh, was that okay? Okay. There you go. You're back. Oh, oh, thanks. I know I got a little warning that my internet just waved. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was going to say that all of your data is at the, you know, Fidelity, at Prudential, at, you know, T roll price, any of these. You should review a software report. It is free to you as the customer. We get them for the audit for every audit for every um, service provider that's hosting an environment. We get a software report and make sure there's no failures of control at that location. I've actually had it where there were failures and we had to do more auditing procedures that there were data problems. Really rare, really rare. Generally, like doesn't happen. I'm not, I don't want to scare you or anything, but I had one client and, and all my seven, well, I've been working for 19 years. I started at PwC, but for 19 years of uh, working, I've had it one time where there was an, a secure, the, uh, the report had to be qualified because of failures and controls. So it's far and few, but it does happen. Now the SOC 2 report should also be available if it's, uh, and that addresses cybersecurity there. Okay, so that's the cybersecurity report. But those two reports, what I would do is I would request them and they should have them readily available. They have to have this type of an audit done every year. So every year there's a current report and you'll have to get the dates of the report. Uh, you can get the report every year. And then if you do have an audit, your auditors will ask you for these reports. Um, so I kind of wanted to tie that into the cybersecurity thing because all this IT, these are like the reports you want to review. And then your own environment, as Matt just said too, um, just making sure your own environment is stable uh, and secure. So there's something here I'm gonna go run through uh, a little bit fast. Um, I'm just gonna get a, kind of get to the point and kind of what it means for you. So SAS 136, that's a statement of auditing standards, okay? So it's really for me as an auditor, but I wanted to talk about what it means to you. So this is a new uh, pronouncement that came out that if you have an audit, um, your auditors might ask about. Uh, now, one thing is that it's actually, you can early adopt it, but we as a firm, our position is that we are not early adopting this standard. So if your audits for the 2020 year should be standard uh, without this pronouncement, and then next year we will take into account this pronouncement. And really what it does is it changes the engagement letter the representation letter and the closing documentation, okay? So there's more things for us to do so it improves our performance as auditors, okay? It's really an auditing standard um, for us, but I wanted to just mention it just in case you hear it on the street, you hear it, you're talking to you know, your networks and things like that, you kind of hear it, or you have auditors that might bring it up. Um, so it, the interesting thing is rather than saying a limited scope audit or um, they're actually, section 103 a3c audits now so they changed the name that's a new name a different audit report okay it's the same thing they just decided to change the name that's the kind of what we're going with that's the kind of um opinion you're going to get you're going to get a section 103 a3c report so we'll go to the next page that's a little bit of accounting jargon for you guys um so actually we'll flip to the next one back because i'll just go through what it means for them i kind of talked about it. thank you um, so what it means to you, right? It means that in the engagement letter for the audit, that management acknowledge their responsibilities are specific, you know, that are specific to audits of ERISA, maintaining a current plan instrument. Like I just said, that plan document, make sure you're having, you have a document. It's formally amended if you need it to be. Your responsibilities for administering the plan and providing us as auditors or whoever your auditor is, with a form 5500 that's complete prior to us dating the report. So pretty much these things were occurring anyway, but it's written that management acknowledge their responsibilities in the engagement letter. The other side of it is that's that's when you sign an auditor on, right? So that's when you sign somebody on. And when you when the audits close, then you have to sign off on a representation letter. And if you're not familiar, a representation letter is a letter that pretty much signifies that you're responsible, there's no fraud, you've done all your job with accounting, um, you know, and you've reconciled your books and records, all of the things that you need to be doing as a plan fiduciary and administer, administrator. So in the representation letter, there's actually beefed up language about current plan instruments, the same thing as the engagement letter, amendments, responsibilities. So the responsibility section just gets beefed up a little bit. 
And then the written communication and reportable findings. We've always had a closing meeting, closing letters, but that also gets beefed up a little bit with any kind of reportable finding section, which is a little bit different than our closing letter now. So really it's not huge changes. They're actually auditing standards. So it really doesn't affect you running the plan. I just wanted to mention it because you might hear it, as I said, in your networks, when you're talking to any of your service providers. And then if you do have an audit, uh, you'll know the engagement letter and the rep letter will be a little bit different. And then the closing meeting that might have some findings if, or not, but they'll bring up that subject. Okay, so I'm going to hand it off to Matt now. If anybody has questions, I'd be happy to take them now or later, and Matt's going to roll with it. Great. Thanks, Mary. And uh, again, if you have any questions, stop me or throw them in the chat. But wanted to uh, start with um, the proposed um, legislation that's out there. We're, we're terming it, and you'll see it out there if you Google it, the SECURE Act 2.0. But this is uh, legislation that has been um, proposed in you know, several different bipartisan bills. Uh, but Chairman Neal and, and Member Brady have brought forth some provisions to basically expand the SECURE Act that Mary went through. Um, so just to kind of highlight, there's 30 of these, so there's a lot. So I just wanted to do some of the key. And again, keep in mind, these are proposed. These aren't final. We will certainly update you as we get more clarification on this and if, as things actually get finalized. But for those of you that 403Bs, one of the um, nice uh, uh, proposed legislations in here is that you can start to use potentially collective investment trusts. So CITs is an investment, very much like a mutual fund that I'm sure all of you use to fund your retirement plans. CITs are essentially, just to keep this simple, a, a more inexpensive version of a mutual fund. So many of the mutual fund manufacturers have created CITs for some of the mutual funds that they offer currently. And essentially, it's just a, a cheaper version because it doesn't have all the registration costs that a mutual fund does, has. Right now in the 403B uh, regs, you can't use collective investment trust. That's actually in the actual uh, IRS regulations, this proposal is to eliminate that and allow CITs to be used in 403Bs, which is a, an advantage because it's a lower cost investment for your participants. So the SECURE Act allowed 401ks to create these pooled employer plans. So a pooled employer plan is essentially a, a multiple employer plan, but in the past, a multiple employer plan, you had to have a common nexus to set one up. So you all had to be like under a certain trade association or whatever that common nexus is from a business standpoint. A pooled employer plan, you don't have to do that anymore. So 401ks can now bring their plans together, even if they have no commonality in terms of their business, uh, to create this pooled employer plan arrangement. And there's benefits because you get the benefit of larger assets in a pooled plan less potentially less responsibilities as a plan sponsor with your again some of the audit requirements as well as some of the day-to-day -day administrative duties so there, there comes a lot of advantages with these pooled employer plan arrangements right now only 401k plans can do this hopefully soon 403bs will be able to take uh take part in it as well there are some credits uh that are out there uh for plans for sponsors to start new plans so the the secure act just increases those credits for those that may want to start or employers that are willing to give an employer contribution. So, um, but one of the other things that's on here, which we've seen some larger plans uh, use what's called a private letter ruling. Does that, so a private letter ruling is essentially an individual plan asking the uh, uh, IRS to bless a provision in their plan, kind of as a one-off. But a lot of these larger, larger plans have been doing this where they're allowing employees uh, to, to, instead of having their deferral go into the, the plan, they're allowing that deferral to go pay their student loans, but that deferral is still a deferral in the plan, so it's eligible for a match. So those, so those employees that are struggling with this high student loan debt, but obviously don't want to sacrifice paying their loans in lieu of saving for retirement, this gives them the option to maybe do both. So this is something that's gaining a lot more traction through those private letter rulings. So this is on the, on the table to allow all plans to adopt that if they, if they feel like it's a good fit. You'll see here too, we knew, we knew this, we were talking about this years ago, but we, know, we knew eventually the, the government was gonna push for plans going to automatic enrollment and automatic escalation. So that means that participants or new employees coming in, they're not actually making an election. The plan's making the election for them. They're just opting out if they don't want to participate. 
So kind of a negative election process, if you will. So this is obviously trying to get people, more people to save, cut through that inertia, which is a big problem out there. Um, now, this is only for new plans. All your plans would be grandfathered in. But I think this is, is something that's not a surprise to us that they're going to start pushing this concept of auto enroll and auto escalation. And then another thing that's out there is um, the catch-up contribution. So for, for those of you participating over 50, you might be taking advantage of this. This is where you can put more in than the 19.5 into your 401k or 403b. Right now it's 26. This is a proposal to add more to that catch-up once somebody hits age, set, age 60. So right now it's 50, and then there might be an escalation up uh, at age 60 for an additional catch-up benefit. So again, giving um, older participants the ability to really max out their contributions at those last few years that they might be saving for retirement. So what are key provisions for individuals? Um, it was mentioned before, the change of RMD, so required minimum distributions. If you're not familiar with that term, that's when the IRS says you have to start taking distributions of your pre-tax retirement accounts. Um, so now the proposal or the uh, SECURE Act moved it from 70 and a half to 72. There is a proposal on the table to move that out to 75. So that's, uh, I think, a benefit for those that are, do not want to be forced. This will give you a little more flexibility. The enhanced savers credit. So this is for lower income folks that are saving for their, in their retirement. There's a credit that they receive based on uh, that contribution and their income. There's, uh, again, a, a propose, proposal out there to increase that credit. Um, to 15 from 1,000, um, and also increase the limits where more people can take advantage of that uh, savers credit. And again, it's an incentive for, again, folks that may be struggling to save can hopefully save and get the benefit of another tax credit there. So we know, and I'm sure you all know this, you have people who leave your organization, they don't take a, a distribution, then you can't find them. Um, and so what, they're, what the, the discussion around this is, is to create an online mechanism where folks can go on that online mechanism and search whether they have a retirement account out there. So somehow I would imagine through maybe your 5,500 reporting, there'll be a database that's created and folks can search that database to see if they have any money under any plan that they may have formerly been participating in. Um, hopefully that allow you guys to get rid of some of those balances that you can't get rid of because you can't find people. Um, this is another thing for a required minimum distribution. So anybody making or with a balance less than a hundred thousand, there's a there's a proposal out there to not have those folks be subject to the required minimum distribution rule. So they any balance under a hundred thousand not be required to take that distribution. Uh, right now with IRAs, there is a catch up, but it's not indexed. So their proposal to index that catch up. And then the last two are are really uh, well the last the last two are more uh, well the. I guess this one, the qualified charitable distribution is for somebody taking the RMD, but wants to make a charitable donation in lieu of that required minimum distribution, you can do that and there's a tax benefit for doing that. So that's a way for you to take a, a required payment and then turn around and make a charitable donation and, and qualify for tax benefits. And then lastly, this qualified longevity annuity, this is a, an option for somebody to take their retirement account balance and basically buy a lifetime income stream. Um, and it's allowing more access to that and higher limits. And that's really for folks that want guarantees. They want to make sure they don't run out of money as they go through their retirement. So those are some things that are coming forward. But again, with the current SECURE Act that got really overshadowed by the, the CARES Act because of, of coronavirus and everything that happened last year, Take a look at the Secure Act provisions that are out there now, because there could be things that you might want to take advantage of. One of the one of the uh, provisions might be allowing your plan to have the distribution for anybody that is uh, planning to have a child, or maybe adopting. You can have you can set up your plan to have a tax free, uh, excuse me, a, a penalty free distribution for those purposes. So the CARES Act, or excuse me, the Secure Act, open that up. Uh, and again, the five hundred hour rule for anybody on a four hundred one k plan that has those part-time employees, make sure you're starting to track those hours. So one thing uh, that Mary said earlier, which was, you know, you're a fiduciary, you make a decision to hire an auditor, that is a fiduciary act. And really everything you're doing in terms of making decisions in your retirement plan is essentially a fiduciary act. And you're held to this prudent man standard. Um, and unfortunately there's no guidelines, there's no playbook on what those standards are. They don't have that that you can access. So what we would say as an advisor is make sure you're taking advantage of all of the ERISA safe harbors out there that you can to protect yourself against any liability. So use that legislation 
and implement a sound risk management process. And we're going to talk about some of the, the key parts of that. And, and not only does that protect you, but of course, the other idea here is, and the reason why you offer a retirement plan is hopefully it also creates better outcomes for your participants. Uh, again, have a, a plan that's achieving the goal of getting folks to a, a comfortable retirement. So when you think about a sound risk management process, I'm sure all of you have heard this before, it's all about process, 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 process. So setting up the, the key parts of that process, actually following it, and then documenting. And Mary spent some, spent some time on documentation, and I would, I would second that. Everything has to be documented, everything you do. And that's what we do for our clients. We document our meeting uh, notes, we create meeting minutes, and we put that in a fiduciary file for them. So it memorializes that meeting because otherwise the meeting didn't happen. So, so again, you are, you are all considered, I'm going to assume everybody on this call is a fiduciary. You, you, you are making decisions on behalf of your plan, whether it's the investments, your service providers, the provisions in the plan document, all those things are a fiduciary act. So you want to make sure, first and foremost, that you recognize that maybe these are things that I don't want to take on myself because I don't feel like I'm, I'm an expert in making those decisions. So you want to think about hiring consultants. And among, many of you already do this. As Mary mentioned, you know, hire an auditor. If you have to do an audit of your retirement plan, you hire a TPA and a record keeper to help you administer the plan and deal with the day-to-day -day record keeping. So we do that today. But some of the other things to think about is hiring an investment advisor and having that investment advisor actually state that they are a fiduciary. And that's really important because this is a way for you to share in some of that fiduciary responsibility with that advisor. They can't take it away, right, because you still have the responsibility of hiring them and monitoring them. And that's a fiduciary act. But you can help share in that responsibility of what you're supposed to do kind of in a day-to-day -day basis when you're uh, you know, uh, monitoring your retirement plan. And advisors come in two different um, kind of two different ways here. A 321 is a, an advisor that provides advice, but they don't have a discretion. So they can't make a change to the investments without you or the committee kind of giving your blessing. A 338 would also uh, not only provide advice, but also the management. So they would have discretion. They would essentially just report to you that, hey, we're making these fund changes based on the investment policy statement and our fund reviews. So just document the, the change and let your participants know, but you're not going to meet to make any decisions. So that's um, the, the, the advisory in terms of that investment advisor, but also something kind of new to the marketplace in the industry is this 316 fiduciary administrator. So many, some of you may work with a TPA, some of you might work in a fully bundled environment with your record keeper that's doing everything. But in some cases, that TPA or potentially that record keeper could act as a, as a fiduciary in regards to the administrative functions of your plan. So actually sharing in that piece with you. So something that is out there, it's, it, it, it could be a, uh, an additional fee for you to use that type of service, but if you're looking to outsource and you want to have more fiduciary protection, having these different parts of it, uh, you know, your investment advisor as well as your administrator fiduciary could be things that you want to surround yourself with to help manage that. Okay. And again, it's a shift of responsibility, but you can never completely absolve yourself of fiduciary liability. Because again, at the end of the day, you have to hire and monitor those, those and service providers. So that's a fiduciary role in itself. As I mentioned, outsourcing administration, and actually Mary touched on this, so many of the providers now will do the eligibility determination for you. They, they will um, approve large, uh, participant loans and hardships. And if you come across a quadro, which happens during a divorce, and these are things that a lot of our sponsors say, I don't wanna get involved with this. I don't wanna know what somebody's financial situation is necessarily. I don't wanna know that they're going through a divorce and having a quadro or, or, or they're taking a loan, quite frankly. I want them to work directly with the provider and any approval uh, should happen with the service provider, not with the, not with the HR department or payroll. So outsourcing those things, not only saving you time and allowing you to run your nonprofit, but also uh, outsourcing to alleviate the responsibilities that you have for qualifying some of those distributions that might come onto your desk. So again, these are things, again, whether it's with a 316 fiduciary administrator or outside, these are things that a lot of TPAs and, and record keepers are now offering clients to help, again, take some of that stuff off your plate. So, so beyond just outsourcing and hiring 
you know, your, your professionals to help you manage your fiduciary liability. I will probably guess most of you, if you looked at your plan document, the, the plan sponsor is listed as the organization. And that's very common that the organization is sponsoring the plan. It's not somebody that you name specifically, um, but it's the organization itself. So what happens when you do that? By default, the board, your board of directors is now the fiduciaries of the plan. So they're responsible now for the plan operation, all the things that we've talked about. So a lot of nonprofits that we work with say, no, no, we want to make sure we delegate our committee as that fiduciary, kind of acting as a, again, as a co-fiduciary, where we're going to really focus on the plan, the investments, the providers. We might report up to the board on decisions we're making, but we're going to really take that responsibility on ourselves. So the way you do that is with a committee charter. Essentially, the charter designates those individuals that are going to be on that committee that are on your, say, called the retirement plan committee, and then all of the different um, responsibilities they, that they have as that committee member, not to mention a fiduciary as well. So you can do this through a couple of different ways, board resolution, or actually have a sign on and resignation process as well. But again, documentation, you want to make sure it's documented. Who are those, who are those committee members, those fiduciaries, and what are their day-to-day -day or responsibilities in that position? So that's what you can do with that committee charter. Along with that is your investment policy statement, something that the Department of Labor doesn't require necessarily. It's not in that prudence uh, man playbook, as I mentioned. But I will tell you, this is the way you document process. To have an investment policy statement that says, this is how often we meet, this is our criteria for selecting, monitoring, and changing uh, the managers, the investment managers in our program, that's what your investment policy statement should do. It should be specific enough to document your process, but not box you into a, into a corner. So it gives you enough flexibility. For example, we come across situations sometimes where managers on our watch list, but we're starting to see some improvement. And we might say as a committee, hey, let's give it another quarter and see if this improvement continues before we change that manager. So having that flexibility to work around situations, but again, having it documented what your process is, that's your investment policy statement. And if you get audited by the Department of Labor and they ask you, you know, how do you pick and choose your investments? How do you monitor and replace managers? You show them your investment policy statement along with all the investment reports that you're using to monitor your process. That's really gonna put you in a really good spot in terms of that um, audit checklist. Another thing we're seeing more and more of is fiduciary training. So I know it's 12 o'clock. Uh, Rob, should I do a, a time check? Do we have any more time or should we? Yeah, keep, no, we're fine. Keep going. Okay. Um, you know, I, I just like, you know, if somebody does need to cut out, um, we will be sending out the presentation. Uh, but um, go ahead, Matt. Okay, so thank you. And I appreciate if you guys hang on. I don't think there's much more, but if you do need to drop off, we understand. Just reach out to me if you have any questions. But fiduciary training is another hot topic with the Department of Labor. This is essentially where the, that committee that you create for, for, the, for the retirement plan you want to make sure they're educated on, again, what is it that they're, they, they're responsible for on that committee? What are those responsibilities? What's the liability? You know, again, you put people into a retirement plan committee. Most that I know I work with say, I'm not an expert. I don't understand a lot of this stuff. So the training is going to get them hopefully up to speed on all the specifics and ins and outs of, of what it is to kind of manage a retirement plan along with your advisor. So this is something that we highly re recommend that you put into place. You have your committee members go through and document that they've been trained. And then as they change, make sure new committee members are getting trained as well as they come on board. Um, so this is something, again, we're seeing more and more in the Department of Labor guidance and something they may be looking for in an audit in terms of your documented fiduciary training. And then reporting. So this is kind of what we would call the service cadence. So, you know, you, you have your, uh, we talked about process, process, process. Well, one of that, one of the, the, the things you want to do is make sure you're having your meetings. And during those meetings, you're actually getting the information to, to, to perform those fiduciary duties, which is, you know, reviewing your investments, uh, making sure you're reviewing your fees. This is one thing too, fees that we've seen huge compression in the marketplace uh, as, Providers have um, have consolidated. We just saw a big one with Mass Mutual moving over to Empower, um, and we've seen a lot of a lot of that going on in the last few years. That's also created a lot of fee compression. So, if you're not monitoring your fees, you might be losing opportunity to not only put pressure on your current service provider for fee uh, reduction, but maybe going out to market 
in finding more competitive solutions that way. So this fee review is important. Again, what I would suggest is doing this at least once a year against the plan average. And then every three to five years, you should be putting your plan out to market. You should be doing a full RFP, a, a true market review to make sure your, your fees, your services, and your investment opportunities are competitive against the marketplace. And then lastly, the, the plan demo, uh, annual plan demographic review, that's usually used to create employee education campaigns. So we look at, okay, who, who in our group is participating and on track, who is not? Do we have to target a certain group um, uh, with our education efforts this year? But that demographic review is really cool in, in dissecting the plan to see where maybe we have spots we need to focus on for improvement. So reporting and keeping that in your, um, your minutes first, make sure you have meeting minutes, as I mentioned. So any meeting you have with your service provider should be documented whether you're doing it or the service provider is. Uh, again, on our side, our, we do the meeting minutes. And when we have meetings, we document everything. So identifying who attended, what issues were discussed, any uh, decisions made, and of course, most importantly, the action items, and then of course, following through on those action items. And then lastly, make sure all of that goes into a, a fiduciary file. Um, so your, your reporting, your meeting minutes, your committee charter, your IPS, all of that should be put into a briefcase. So for auditing purposes, or if somebody like Mary says, hey, I want to see your committee meeting minutes, I want to see your reporting, that's all there for them to go and find in one place. Uh, so it's easy uh, for your auditors uh, you know, to do that type of work for you. So the fiduciary file documenting is really, really important. Um, again, Mary mentioned the ERISA bond, the Fidelity bond, that, that's for the plan itself. But I would also encourage you all to maybe consider fiduciary insurance as part of your overall corporate insurance plan. This would cover you. It's, it's, it's beyond the Fidelity bond. This protects members of that committee against a fiduciary breach. Um, so just this is something that, again, I want to make sure it's clear. It's not the Fidelity bond or ERISA bond. It's something separate that you can use to protect yourself beyond just some of the, the safe harbor guidelines that we talked about today. And then in closing, you know, we talked about we do all these things, you know, monitor our investments, service providers, fees, make sure we're doing all the right things. But the idea is to make sure we have a successful plan. And, and also part of it is looking at your plan design. Um, you know, a couple uh, some of you may have just recently gone through a 403B plan restatement where you had to restate to a new plan document. 401K plans are going through that now again. This is a great opportunity for you to go through your plan provisions that may have been set up years and years ago under completely different circumstances and see, is our plan accomplishing what, what we want it to do? Are we allowing people to contribute when as soon as they, we want them to? We, is the match working or employer contribution? Is our vesting schedule? You know, all of those things that we kind of take for granted, if there's no reason behind why it was set up that way, I think it's worth at least a discussion to make sure it's still providing the results that you want out of your plan. Because at the end of the day, again, that creates that culture and hopefully uh, what creates the, the uh, benefit uh, for the participant over time. And then we talk about this courageous plan design. I'll close on this one. This is, again, going back to automatic enrollment, auto escalation, you know, things like that, that more and more of our plan sponsors, our nonprofit uh, plan sponsors are, are, are looking at. And this really started with really large plans, but we've seen it come down to even really small plans, some plans less than 50 people doing stuff like this to have that um, that system, if you will, where someone's hired, they're automatically start saving in their retirement plan. They don't have to do anything. They just, it just will happen for them. Of course, they can go in and change and modify it. They could stop it as well, but we find that most people don't opt out. If you have a plan with auto enrollment, most participants don't, don't opt out. If they change anything, they're changing the contribution. They're not, they're not uh, saying, I don't want to do this at all. It's very low opt-out rate. So thinking about those things, and in, in we, we use education, we use that method to hopefully increase participation and deferral rates and get people on track, but sometimes it's just not enough. And if that's a goal of you, yours as a sponsor, as an organization, looking at some of those things like auto-enroll, auto-escalation could be the, the way to go to get to that, that um, you know, again, to get to that end goal. So these are things that we have conversations about all the time. You know, adding Roth is a new one too that we're seeing a lot of sponsors uh, take advantage of. It doesn't cost anything and it's just a nice flexibility. 
for your plan participants. So sometimes it can be simple plan design changes and sometimes a little bit more courageous, as I mentioned. So I know that was a lot of information, um, you know, some things that um, have happened, some things to look forward to in the future, and then just, just, just some hopefully guidelines for you guys uh, as you go through managing your retirement plan to help you. Um, I know Mary and I are available if you have any questions outside of this session, but if there are any questions, please let us know. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mary and Matt. Um, well done. As Matt said, they're, they're, we covered a lot uh, in a short time, so feel free to reach out to them. Uh, as Roland mentioned, you know, our partners truly care about the nonprofit sector, so feel free to reach out if you need their services or have any questions. Um, just want to make two quick announcements. Uh, we have two webinars uh, that are coming up next week, or actually there's one next week. Uh, we teamed up with Aetna to bring an exclusive healthcare benefit program to nonprofit organizations. We'll be having a seminar around that on May the 6th, uh, based around the AFA program. And then uh, on May 20th, actually, let me start my video there. On May 20th, uh, our partner, The Connection, is having a webinar on the keys uh, to winning, to writing winning grants. So, you know, if that's not in your wheelhouse, as you know, all of our, um, our uh, webinars are free to our members. So feel free to join in if you'd like and, you know, spread the word to your coworkers and they're more than welcome to attend. So. Thanks for being Tango members. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll have the presentation to you out in the next couple of days. And once again, if you do have any questions, you can certainly reach out directly to both Mary and Matt. So have a great day and thanks everybody.